Our human anatomy and development, as we said, it has got three parts. The gross anatomy, the which we'll be talking about, what you can touch, the structures that you can see and touch, and then the histology part, which is the microscopic part. We'll start with, this is how the topics go. We'll start with cells, and then we'll be looking at tissues, and then we'll do organs, and then the, the course is done. Now, it's, uh, that is a very big summary I've said, otherwise it's long. And when it comes to anatomy, what they love is histology and gross. You also do the embryology, how things form, but questions are limited to which they bring. So, smart studying is concentrating on histology and on gross anatomy. On embryology, there are some specific, some topics which are a must know. You need to know, and I'll tell you those topics as we go. And you don't study everything because it's too bulky. Okay, so that is it. So this is histology, and this is the first topic in histology which is the histological techniques. Now, histology is the study of tissue, tissues which make up the body, and how the tissues are going to be arranged to make up organs. Now, you know that, okay, well, I'm going to mention that, how the tissues are going to be arranged to be able to make up organs. Tissues are usually going to be like webs. You know how a, a most, uh, what insect is that? How a spider is, the way those things are, those are waves. So you are going to have interwoven filaments. These are more like ropes and different fibers and also cells and also things which are not cells and different things. That will be what will make up tissue. So histology will involve all aspects of tissue biology with a focus on how cells, structure, and arrangements are going to be able to optimize the function of specific organs. How are cells going to be able to make the organ do the function that they get to do? Okay, so tissue is going to have two components which interact. There are only two things which make up tissue. The first one is cells. The second one, extracellular matrix. Think of it. For you to make a house, what do you need? Anyone who can tell me the two most important things that you need when you want to make a house. Imagine you wanted to start a house such that even if you don't have enough money, what everyone who wants to make a house should have, what should they have? Let's interact so that it can be an interesting class. Okay, Steve says can't get me. Hope hope others can. You can't see the screen. Okay, log out and then log in. You are going to be able to see it. Okay, so for you to be able to build the house, the first thing that you need are bricks, okay? Bricks, whether you are rich or you are poor, you need bricks, but the, the, just the kind of bricks will determine the kind of house you are going to have. Apart from that, you also need what? You need to also have the uh, the, the sand, right? The sand, which can just be from the ground or the special one. So those are things that you need. Now, cells in this case are representing the bricks. And then extracellular matrix is representing everything else that you are going to use to hold the cells or to hold the bricks. You need water, you need sand, some also put wires there, others use small stones. So everything like that to represent extracellular matrix just to hold the cells, all right? That's extracellular matrix. Now, extracellular matrix is made up of protein fibers. There's a microphone on. Kindly of switch it off. Okay. So, extracellular matrix is going to be made up of protein fibers. Who has a mic on to switch it off? Okay, thank you. So, we are saying electro, uh, extracellular matrix is going to have protein fibers and ground substance. Think of the ground substance as the sand that you need. 
and then the protein fibers are those to stones because if you build your house like you put bricks with only sand it might not be that strong so you need also those to small stones wires to be able to hold the sand properly so that the house can stand so those are protein fibers now there are three protein fibers that you need to know and all the types of tissue that we are going to discuss we'll be talking about the cells which make up the tissue the protein fibers which make up a tissue and also the ground substance so depending with the composition which ones is going to be more will determine the function of that tissue so the kind of protein fibers that we have we have got collagen fibers reticular fibers elastic fibers i've not just included ground substances you have got also different kinds of ground substances but the majority we call them gags g-a-g glycosaminoglycans if you remember in carbohydrates we talked about glycosaminoglycans those are ground substances now we have got only if, even if the body is very big we only have four types of tissue all the cells in the body only make up four types of tissue nervous tissue epithelial tissue muscle tissue and connective tissue the nervous tissue this is the one which is involved in transmitting of impulses for you to feel pain for you to be conscious like that, you need the nervous tissue. You also have the epithelial tissue. The epithelial tissue, this is just uh, what uh, the tissue that you, uh, which will line body cavities. For example, your skin is made up of epithelium or epithelial tissue. Every place where there is an, uh, uh, something that is open, it should have epithelial tissue in your nose. If you follow your GIT, your, you call it the digestive system, okay? That space, there is epithelial tissue. If you follow your respiratory system, there's epithelial tissue. Every place where there is opening, if you follow the, your reproductive system in the penis, in the vagina, all those, you have epithelial tissue. And you understand all the ty different types because what you start doing is that you'll be looking at each one of these as a topic. Epithelial tissue is the one you start with and then you'll go to connective tissue, muscle tissue, nervous tissue like that. After tissues, then you'll do organs. But what is of importance for now is to know at least the tissue and dysfunction. Muscle tissue is involved in contraction that we know muscles contraction also supporting movement connective tissue this one is for support and protection of organs to be able to protect organs we need connective tissue now remember we said that tissue is made up of cells and extracellular matrix so if you look at these four types of tissue connective tissue is the one which has got the most abundant extracellular matrix and then the one which has got the least uh, abundant extracellular matrix is going to be nervous tissue. Nervous tissue doesn't have a lot of extracellular matrix. Instead, it's going to have cells. So take note of this because it can come in multiple choice, which one of the following as the most abundant type of extracellular matrix is the connective tissue. Okay. So, as we have said, despite the complexity of the body, it only has got four tissues. So, what will happen is that cells form tissues, tissues form organs, organs form systems, systems form organisms, and there are only four types of tissue. Epithelial tissue for protection, connective tissue for support, muscular tissue for contraction, the nervous tissue for conduction of nervous impulses. Now, what happens is, is how, do, how can you prepare tissue in order for you to study let's say for example I, I want to study about connective tissue i want to get connective tissue and study it or i want to get a thorough tissue and study it or i want let's say i find a body uh, i want to study about a certain part of the body how can i prepare it for me to study it that is what we call preparation of tissue for study so the most common procedure used in histology to research is the preparation of tissue sections so what will happen is that you are going to get a body part you start cutting it into parts into a small part that you can use on a microscope so under light microscope tissues are going to be examined 
visually in a beam of transmitted light you're going to so there are different types of microscope now we'll talk about that most tissues and organs are too thick for light to pass through them because they are too thick what must happen is that you need to cut them into small small parts so what is the reason why are you cutting the tissue into small parts so that light can pass through them because without light passing through them you cannot view under a microscope under a light microscope now the instrument that you use to for cutting tissue into small small sections which you can use on the microscope is you called a microtome so in my first anatomy test this is the first the uh, diagram that he brought the diagram from a microtome okay so this one that you can see here is what is called a microtome this is the first diagram that they brought first anatomy histology practical test name the instrument others we are saying microscope so please microtome okay so just other things you should just look at this one so that you see the parts which will make up a microtome there is a part, a part where you are going to be able to place your tissue so that you can you can cut it you can see you have got a steel knife there is going to be a knife there we're going to be using to be able to cut your tissue into very small, small sections. Now, what will be the steps of preparation of tissue? What are the steps of preparing a tissue? And you need to know them in order. There's one exam which they just said, write the, the steps of tissue preparation, 10 marks. Okay, you need to know them in order. So this is the order of tissue preparation. What should happen is that first, you need to obtain your tissue, you obtain your specimen. Now, specimen can be collected either from, uh, from different uh, places. Let's say I want to study about this body part. Uh, someone has come to your clinic and then they've got a cancer. So you are going to cut part of that uh, tissue and then you have collected your specimen. The second thing is now fixation. Fixation is where you preserve the tissue in the original form. So that tissue that you have cut, now you, are, you want to preserve it so that it's not destroyed by the outside environment because inside the body there are some things which maintain it. So I want to maintain it. That is fixation. And then if you preserve it into its original form, now there's going to be dehydration. Dehydration is the removal of water from tissues. Okay, you are trying to remove water from the tissue that you have preserved. And then after you remove water, now there's going to be clearing. Clearing is where now you use paraffin as a solvent so that the paraffin can enter that tissue that you have removed water from. The paraffin enters it to infiltrate it. And then after you infiltrate that tissue with the paraffin, now you are going to perform embedding. And embedding is now you are infu infiltrating that tissue with paraffin wax. Now this is a wax. A wax, you want the tissue now to become a solid. You know how wax is, right? So that is how you want the tissue to become, to become solidish. Okay. After you embed it, now you can trim it. To trim it is now you are putting the paraffin block in orderly condition by clipping, pruning. You are trying to clip it. You are, you are pruning it. You are cutting what is not necessary. And then you are also going to have sectioning. Now, sectioning is where now you cut that tissue into very, very small slides. Very, very small slides. And that is going to be using a microtome. Okay. And then you are now, after you have cut that tissue into very small parts using a microtome, you now stain your tissue. You are going to use some colors so that you can be able to see it well because there are some organelles that you cannot see. There are some organelles that you cannot see not until you stain them. So that will be the staining and then you mount your tissue on the slide. You put it now on the microscope for you to be able to view. Are we going together? Are we good?
Okay. Now we need to understand each one of these steps. So starting, remember we have already obtained your tissue. Now the first step after you have obtained your tissue is going to be fixation. F what is fixation? Fixation is a process of treating pieces of organ as soon as possible after removal from the body. Okay. With the solutions of stabilizing or cross-linking compounds called fixatives. So after you remove it from the body, you want to preserve it so that it cannot be destroyed. All right. That is fixation. Now, the fixatives, those compounds which you are using to preserve tissue, they are known as fixatives. What they do is that they, are, they prevent that tissue from autolysis. Autolysis is where the, because tissue has got enzymes. Okay, enzymes can destroy their own tissue. They can start eating up their own tissue. So you, the, the fixatives will be able to prevent enzymes from eating their own tissue. Because a fixative must fully diffuse through the tissue to preserve all tissue, tissues are usually cut into small fragments before fixation can happen. Because that compound that you are using to fix that tissue has to penetrate. You, you have also some other fixatives which you can use. You, you pass them in blood. You, you inject them. So those we, are, we call them. intravascular perfusion intravascular perfusion of fixatives can be used for some organs or laboratory animals okay because the fixative in this case rapidly reaches the tissue through the blood so what happens is that if you inject that thing that is supposed to preserve a tissue it's going to go into the blood and then it will go to other organs to preserve them this is what happens if a person dies this is what you'll be dealing with. You'll be dealing with dead body. So you are you are going to see that you have got cadavers, people who died some time back, but you, you are still working with them. That is because they were injected formalin. That is a, a, a fixative. And it preserved the body so that you can work with it even when the person passed on some time back. So the assignment I'll give you is go and find out in what blood vessels can you use to inject formalin to preserve a dead body? Because that's one question which I saw in the exam. Okay, so examples of fixatives that you can use. If what you are working with, you want to use it on a light microscope. Light microscope, you use light. Electron microscope, will use electrons to be able to view your tissue. For light microscope, you use formalin. Formalin is a buffered solution that contains 37% formaldehyde. You understand about formaldehyde if I start teaching you organic chemistry because, yeah. But take note of this. When you want to use a fixative for something that you use on a light microscope, you use formalin. Formalin is what? A certain solution of 37% formaldehyde. And this question can come. You see options 10% formaldehyde. What percent is 37% formaldehyde? And then for electron microscope, the fixative that you can use is glutaraldehyde. So both formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde do just prevent tissue degradation by reacting with the amine group. Yes, Modesta. Maybe it's you who can see. How about others? Are we able to see? Okay, so if it's not visible, there might be a problem with the network. Just try to connect, disconnect, and then connect back. Okay. So, with a greater magnification and resolution of very small structures in the electron microscope, fixation must be done carefully to preserve ultra structure details so as you are doing your fixation as you are trying to make sure that you preserve your tissue sometimes you can end up destroying small, small structures in the cell so as you are preserving your tissue make sure that you do it carefully so that you you don't destroy small structures so towards the end 
after you do fixation, you can do what is known as a double fixation procedure. And you are going to use a buffered solution of glutaldehyde and then followed by an immersion. After you use glutaldehyde and then you get your compound, you dip it in osmium tetroxide. That is double fixation. You started with the glutaldehyde and then you dipped your compound in osmium tetroxide. Osmium tetroxide will just preserve membrane lipids. Okay, every time you hear of osmium, just think of lipids. Osmium lipids, there'll be a point when you really want to know this, but know it. Every time you hear of osmium, just think of lipids. Osmium tetroxide will be able to preserve lipids. That's why we're using it in double fixation. Now, the second step after fixation, after you've preserved your tissue, is dehydration. You want to remove water. So in dehydration, water is going to be removed from your tissue. And how you do that is that you are going to use, you are going to be transferring a graded series of ethanol. So you remove water using alcohol. You are going to be using alcohol, adding alcohol to tissue. But as you're adding alcohol to tissue, you always use this order. You are going to start with alcohol. Oh, that is 70% concentrated. You go to, and then after that, you remove your tissue. You put it now in alcohol that is 80% concentrated, and then you put it in 90% concentrated, and then in 100%. You just don't just start like that. And the reason for that is that you want to make sure that you completely remove water. Think of it when you get you, you, you. You, you rinse your clothes, right? You want to remove the water. What you do is that you are going to first uh, compress your clothes. You not compress them very much. You first compress them, you remove water, you are going to relax. And then you are going to compress a little bit more tighter and then you relax. And then you compress even all the more, you relax. And then you compress all the more. By then, the water would have been gone. So you are working in it a different amount so you compress a bit and then you increase and then you increase and then you increase so that you make sure that you completely remove the water that is why you are using alcohol from 70 percent to 100 percent concentrated so by then we would have removed the water and then after you've removed the water using alcohol now you there is need for clearing now your tissue doesn't have water, it now has alcohol. So alcohol has to be removed. So to remove alcohol, you are going to replace alcohol with organic solvents. Now these organic solvents should be miscible with both alcohol and the embedding medium. These organic compounds or solvents which should replace the alcohol should mix with the alcohol. So as a solvent is going to be uh, infiltrating the tissue or as the solvent is going to be replacing the alcohol, the tissue will become more transparent. It becomes clear. That is why we call this clearing. In other words, you can look through it. Okay. And remember that's the aim because you want to make sure that light can pass through. So the fully cleared tissue is then going to be placed in melted paraffin. After you remove all the water from that tissue, then now you are going to place that tissue not re removing water after you've removed all the alcohol from that tissue you are now going to place that tissue into melted paraffin that paraffin should be at a temperature between 52 degrees Celsius and 60 degrees Celsius. take note of the temperature please just take note of that okay so the next process after now you've removed your tissue it has now you have removed your alcohol it has now become clear it is now embedding so in embedding, tissues are going to be embedded in solid medium to facilitate sectioning. Embedding, basically, in order to cut very thin sections, tissue might be infiltrated after fixation. What you are trying to do is that you want to make sure that you add, okay, you are adding, basically, think of it. You cannot cut your tissue that you have just made clear because it's not that strong enough. So you want to make it at least a bit solid so that it can be cut. So embedding materials will include paraffin and plastic resins. If you add paraffin to a tissue, it will make it a bit more stronger. Okay, to it will become like a solid. 
and then now you can cut that tissue into small pieces. So when you are using light microscopy, a light microscope, the, the embedding materials you'll be able to use it will be paraffin or resins. For electron microscope, we only use resins. Take note of that. So the fully cleared tissue is then going to, the tissue that has been cleared is now going to be placed in melted paraffin, as we said. The paraffin is melted and it is between 52 degrees Celsius and 60 degrees Celsius. So when you put that tissue into paraffin that is melted at this temperature, as the temperature, at such temperatures, the clearing solvent is going to be able to evaporate. That solvent that you are using to replace the alcohol, remember, is going to evaporate. And the tissue now is going to be filled with the liquid paraffin, this same paraffin in which you've placed your, your tissue. So now when this began, be, begins to, the temperature begins to fall, the paraffin, remember, was melted. It will become, it will start to become solid. Okay, so the impregnated tissue then is going to harden uh, into a small container of paraffin at room temperature. The ethanol or solvent are later going to be replaced. So that ethanol that you used at the beginning is going to be out. The alcohol, remember you had removed the alcohol, it became clear. Now you are now using the paraffin. The paraffin is invading the tissue. Plastic embedding is going to avoid the higher temperatures needed for paraffin embedding, which helps to avoid shrinkage and major distortions of the tissue. So when you are using plastic, it will prevent the tissue from being destroyed. So your tissue is going to be okay. It's going to be fine. And then after that, now we're going to perform sectioning. What is section? After you've embedded, now your tissue, remember you've embedded, it has become a solid. Now you can cut it into pieces. Sectioning, you're going to use a microtome, a hardened block of tissue that has been replaced with paraffin can now be cut or sectioned using a microtome. So generally, Paraffin sections are going to be cut at 1 to 10 micrometers thickness. So this is how small they are going to become. Well, the glass or diamond knife of ultra microtomes will produce sections of less than 1 micrometer for electron microscopy. So these microtomes we are talking about can cut something such that it becomes very slim, slimmer than a plain paper, very slim. Think of it, one micrometer, that is very, very small, okay? So take note because they can bring this in multiple choice. An ultra microtome can section up to less than one micrometer and use for electron microscopy. Very thin sections are going to be placed Then Those thin sections which you have gotten will be now placed on a glass slides and then they're going to be stained. After you stain them, you can now, you first stain them and then place them on a glass slide and then they can now be viewed. Now staining, staining is done routinely. So what you want to do is in staining, you want to make sure that when you are viewing under a microscope, let's say the nucleus, let's say you stain, the kind of stain you are using, the nucleus starts to look blue. So that you can differentiate the nucleus, let's say from the cell wall, let's say the cell wall is going to be looking green. So that's the main reason of staining, so that you can see structures clearly. Because if you do not stain, the entire cell and all the components in the cell will just be looking the same. You get that? Huh? So that's the importance of staining. Now, this is very high yield in your first histology practical test. This is coming in your test one theory, it is coming. So, Max, tissue components, you have got tissue components, like for example, the nucleus. Now you know that the nucleus contains RNA and RNA has got phosphate groups. Phosphate groups are negative. So we call them 
anions, things which are negatively charged, they are known as anions. So those components of the tissue which are negatively charged will stain with the dyes which are positive. You need to understand this. So tissue components which are negative will stain with dyes which are positive. Okay. So tissues, tissues which are negative, the charged, we call them acidic. Because the characteristic of an acid is like negative charge. Think of the carboxylic acid functional group. So that is negative. So because tissue components which are negatively charged, they are acidic, they are going to be stained by dyes which are positive. And dyes which are positive, they are basic dyes. So negative structures are going to be stained by basic dyes. So we call the, those structures as being basophilic okay basic dyes are going to be termed as basophilic so basophilic dyes will give mostly a blue or a purple color so structures which can be stained by basic dyes includes dna because it is negative rna because it's negative and these things are found like in the nucleus also glycosaminoglycans and also the matrix of cartilage these are going to be stained by basic dyes. And basic dyes include the hematoxylene, toluid in blue, methylene blue, alcine blue. Every time you hear of blue, blue at the end, just know that this dye is basic. It means that it stains structures which are acidic. And examples of acidic structures DNA or the nucleus just. Trust me, if you don't know this information here, it will be very bad. Okay, and then for those structures which are positively charged, we call them cut ions. Most of the structures in the cytoplasm are actually positively charged. For example, proteins, they have got a lot of amino groups and amino groups are positively charged. So those which are positively charged are going to be attracted to dyes which are negatively charged and dyes which are negatively charged are acidic dyes. And these structures are basic structures. So acidic dyes are attracted to basic structures. And acidic dyes, the color they mostly give is either pink or red. The basic dyes is blue or purple. So some structures which are as which are which are basic, which are positively charged, include the mitochondria. You have got some granules, secretory granules in the cytoplasm, also collagen. So these can be stained by dyes which are negatively charged or acidic dyes. And acidic dyes include the Eosin, orange G, acid diffusin. Okay, especially eosin. Always remember, orange G, always remember. Okay, acid diffusin. These are some acidic dyes, meaning that these structures, the mitochondria, will look pink or red. The collagen fibers will look pink or red. Now, most of the times when you are staining, in many staining procedures, you are going to use hematoxylin together with eosin. So we call it H and E staining because we use hematoxylin, which is H, and eosin, which is E. So hematoxylin will be the first stain, and it will be staining those structures which are, remember, we are staining those structures which are negative, okay, because it is a basic dye. And then the second dye that you use, you call it the counter stain. Because when you are staining, remember, hematoxin only stain DNA, RNA, glycosaminoglycans, and the matrix. How about the mitochondria? They see, oh, what color are they going to look? They might not even be seen. So if you want to view the mitochondria, while you have used the hematoxin to view DNA, to view the nucleus which contains DNA, you are also going to use it. Eosin, so that you can also view the mitochondria, okay, together. So you use H and E like that. So eosin is a counter stain to hematoxin because the second dye that you're going to be able to use. The final step now, after you stain, will be to put, get your slide or your specimen to put it on a slide and then view on a microscope, okay view on a microscope now there are various different types of dyes that you use and you need to know the dye you need to know also the 
structure as it stands and the color. You need to know. And some just important dice that you need really a must know. You have got what we call pass, periodic acid skiff. Pass is used to stain polysaccharides, complex polysaccharides, and glycogen. We know glycogen is an example of a polysaccharide. And glycogen is also found in mucus. So when you are staining, let's say, the digestive system, the digestive system contains some cells which we call the epithelium of the digestive system contains goblet cells which produce mucus. So you expect mucus to be stained or goblet cells to be stained by pus because they contain glycogen. The liver is a point where there is a storage of carbohydrates in form of glycogen. So expect the liver also to be stained by pus. Okay. So the color that you are going to be able to see is deep red color, which is magenta when you are using pus. So what does pus stain? Glycogen and those compounds which contain carbohydrates. Another one is mallory staining. Mallory. Now mallory is made up of three different components. It has got Aussian blue, acid fusin, and orange G. These are the components of mallory. And these will be able to stain things like collagen, cytoplasm, also the red blood cells. Okay, so every time you hear of mallory, at least think of collagen, cytoplasm, and red blood cells. At least those. And then another one is known as gomory trichrome. This one will be able to stain muscles and the cytoplasm. And this will look red in color. You can see this, this slide which is here. So this red that you can see, if you use gomor, you just know that, okay, those are muscles. That's the cytoplasm of the muscle. The nucleus will look blue in color. So if you just see any bluish, bluish things there, you should be able to know that, okay, it's the nucleus. And then collagen. Pardon? Is that a question? Okay, th that is that was just something else I said. It is black, yes. For collagen fibers, we're going to be able to see blue. So these bluish things that you can see, that means that's collagen. And then you also have the Vehof stain. This one, please, is a must know. Vehofstein. Remember I talked about, we said that uh, tissue is made up of cells and extracellular matrix. Extracellular matrix is made up of what? Protein fibers and the ground substance. And protein fibers, we mentioned three. Collagen fibers, elastic fibers, and reticular fibers. Already we have said that collagen fibers can be stained by, we mentioned it here, it can be stained by eosin. And then, Elastic fibers can be stained by Vehof and they'll appear black. Look at this. Okay, this is how the iota will be looking when you stain because it has got elastic fibers. And these are some slides that you'll be swatting as time comes in. When you just see this, you know, okay, this is the iota. And then you also have the gym sustain. Gym sustain is also known as right sustain. This one is a must know. Every time you hear gym sustain, Sometimes they'll just say right stain. This is a special stain for blood. Okay? A special stain for blood. What are the components of gems stain? It is made up of azu, methylene blue, and eosin. Please take note of these three components. Azu, methylene blue, and eosin. And you can see for the red blood cells, they are just stained black. Red blood cells don't have a nucleus, okay? I mean, they're just the red, not black. So those are the ones that you can see. And then this cell that you can see here, you have got some aneutrophils. You also have oh, the lymphocytes. This is a lymphocyte. You understand this, but just know that gym sustain or right sustain is used for staining blood. Okay, so please just make sure that you, you swatter this table here, this one. 
have written the structure that will be stained, the stain, and also the color. So you can see what will stain collagen is Van Gison. And this is this is very important. Collagen can be stained by Van Gison or Mason trichrome. Van Gison or Mason trichrome. Elastic fibers by Vehoff. Especially the fibers, the three fibers, collagen fibers, elastic fibers, reticular fibers, collagen, Van Gison. How can you swat that? Collagen has got a G in it. So Van Gison, Van Gison, there's a G there. And also Mason trichrome. But when you use Van Gison, it will be red. If you use Mason trichrome, it will be blue or green. Elastic fiber, you use it, Vehoff. So you can see for these fibers, it is Van, V, V. Vehoff also V. But this Van Gison, the one which has got a G, it is for collagen. The one which has no G, the Vehoff. Is just for elastic, okay? And then reticular fibers will be stained by, and this one is a must, no? Reticular fibers will be stained by silver impregnation. So every time you hear of silver stain, silver stain, just think of reticular fibers, silver stain, and they'll be black. Silver stain, reticular fibers. And then the myelin. Nerve cells are made up of myelin. They can be stained by osmium tetroxide. Remember what did I say about osmium? Anyone who remembers, I, I mentioned something about os osmium. Every time you hear of osmium, what should you think about? If you remember. Every time you think of osmium, think of lipids, fats. Myelin is made up of fat. Okay. And then also melanin. Melanin, what gives you the color? Mason, Mason Fontana. Also lipids. Now take note of lipids. In the body, I've got a lot of lip, lipid stores. We call them adipocytes. You use Sudan black or osmium. Every time you hear of osmium, think of lipids. Okay. At least these, please, you need to know them. Now, we'll not talk about microscopy. We'll talk about microscopy in the next class. Okay, I think it is very short. Let me just try to summarize it. What you need to know about microscopy. Microscopy, you are not trying to study things under a microscope. Here is a microscope. Simple parts of a microscope that you already know. You have got the eyepiece, objective lenses, coarse adjustment knob, fine adjustment knob. The microscopy, a microscope can magnify structures. Magnification is just how much big the compound has become. Magnification is given by the size of the object, the size of the image over the subject of the object. Object is what we are using. Image is what you can see with your eyes on the microscopes. Maybe something is looking 20 times bigger or something is looking as so it is 20 centimeters, but it's actually 2 centimeters. So say 20 over 2, that will give magnification. You can calculate total magnification by multiplying the magnifying power of the eyepiece. Let's say the eyepiece is magnifying something 100 times. You multiply by the magnifying power of the objective lens. Say it's magnifying something 40 times. So 10, 100 times 40, that will be 400. That will be the total magnification. So if you look at the microscope, it has got basically two parts, mechanical parts and optical parts. Mechanical parts, these are the ones which are just involved in now you are going to be able to handle the, and the microscope. Optical parts these are the ones which will control the way you are going to be able to view the object and how light to be able to move. Optical parts, you have got the condenser, objective lens, and the eyepiece. And then the rest of the parts are mechanical. Now, we have different types of microscope. We have got optical microscopes which use light or photons. You also have electron microscopes which use electrons and scanning probe microscopes. Now, optical microscopes can either be simple or compound. Simple microscopes have got a single lens. Compound microscopes have got two lenses. You have got the objective lens and the eyepiece. The compound microscopes, you have got bright field Bright field meaning that you are viewing something, okay, and then the background is looking bright or it's looking white, and then the object is looking dark. That is a bright field. For the dark field, 
the background will be looking dark while the object is looking light, the object that you are viewing. And then phase con contrast is, is a microscope that is used to visualize and stand things and they are live, they are not dead. And the background is going to be dark also. Fluorescence microscope, this one is used to identifying specific antigen or proteins in immunohistology. So when you want to see antigens, uh, what is an antigen? What is an antigen? An antigen is just a protein that belongs to your body. Okay, proteins which make up you, which should not be destroyed. And then you also have a polarized light microscope. Polarized, every time you hear of polarized, these ones are used to visualize bifrigent substances. What do you mean by bifrigent? These are substances where light cannot pass through them. So you can actually see them when light cannot pass through them. For example, bones, teeth, and some skeletal muscles and cardiac muscles. Those are known as bifrigent. So bifrigency is a principle of polarized light microscope. Electron microscopes, can you can have a transmission electron microscope or a scanning electron microscope. What I just want to mention about bright field microscope, you can see the background is bright, it's white, and then what you are viewing is looking darkish there. Something is known as resolving power. What is resolving power? Resolving power is the smallest distance between two particles at which they can be seen as separate objects. That is what we call resolving power. It is the smallest distance at which you can see different two different objects as different. Let's say, for example, if I'm very far, I am holding someone. Okay, I'm, ve I'm very far away from you and I'm with someone. You might think we are maybe so close as that we are touching. But the closer you come, you will see that, okay, there is actually a distance between us. Okay, so that minimum, smallest distance between particles at which you can see two objects as being separate is what we call resolving power. So the maximum resolving power of a light microscope is approximately 0 0.2 micrometers. This is the distance at which you can see that objects are different and not touching each other. Objects smaller or thinner than 0 0.2 micrometers, such as ribosomes, a membrane or filaments, cannot be distinguished with this instrument. So for resolving power, the bigger, the bigger the magnification of a microscope, the bigger the resolving power of that microscope. Okay, take note of that. The greater the magnification, the greater the resolving power of that microscope. You also have, oh, I actually put it here. Resolving power of a microscope depends. Now, the resolving power only depends on the objective lens. Does not depend on the eyepiece. Depends on the objective lens. We also have something that is known as perfocal. Perfocal refers to objectives that can be changed with minimum or no refocusing. So, when you have got a microscope, a microscope has got different parts, right? You have got some microscopes which have got like three objective lenses. So perfocal just refers to you changing the objectives without refocusing. In other words, you are changing the objectives, but the way you are seeing the object is not changing. The focus is not changing. You are not refocusing the, ob the, the, ob the, the focus of that microscope. Hope you get that. That's perfocal. You are changing the objectives, but not refocusing. Okay, that is it. Okay, let, let's try. To, these are all exam questions which are at the end here. Let's, let's go. Now, I will not have time for me to answer with you. What I'll do is I'm going to send these. You are going to be able to try them. Okay, I'm going to post them on the Google Drive and also on YouTube. They're not supposed to them on Google Drive. Please try them. These are all from past papers last year's this one and these other years okay thank you so much